next uh, part of today's lecture will be uh, a roundtable of some sort with Timo Toke, who is uh, the CEO of Ready Player Me, um, a really, really interesting company. Um, we had this uh, conversation with Athena before. Um, there's a lot of uh, bring your identity around in the metaverse or interoperability in the metaverse. There's a lot of talk and there's a lot of uh, noise, but not many describe what it really means. And here you are building a business in the, into the heart of what it means. I think Athena described it so nice before how important identity is and, and you're building interoperability in, in, with identity. So mm -hmm. welcome to welcome to the class. And thank um, you. The, the, the team has prepared some questions and we'll see how this flows. So mm -hmm. I'll start with some. Um, Perfect. Maybe can you introduce yourself a little bit and tell mm -hmm. us who you are and, and what is your what was your path to get into the metaverse and get into these ideas that lead to your passion to start this company. Yeah, totally. Thank you for the kind words and, and definitely happy to be here and, and have have a chat about all those things. So um, yeah, so basically I started um, my career in the metaverse uh, as a kid uh, playing RuneScape. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was my first kind of like business was selling RuneScape gold to other kids in school. And I spent many years just playing a lot of RuneScape, which kind of made me uh, realize how much, you know, virtual assets have value in real in the real world, gaming assets. So that was a good kind of a first step. And then um, uh, and then I was interested in 3D. I got interested in 3D printing. I was messing around with 3D printers, which led me to scan things just for, to print them, which led me to scan um, and my friends and people which led to avatars. And then uh, nine years ago, when Oculus was acquired by Meta or Facebook by, by, back then, um, we realized that, or we thought that VR is probably going to happen uh, and it's going to happen soon. And in VR, avatars play a hugely important role. Like you are an avatar, you speak with other people face-to-face -face that use avatars. So we thought it's very important to solve a problem for creating avatars or make it easier for people to create avatars. And it started from hardware. So building studios, building scanners with, you know, 20 to a few hundred cameras, and then scan tens of thousands of people. Um, and then after hardware, we found a way to build a deep learning solution using the database we collected. Um, they will take a single selfie and convert that into different styles of avatars. Um, and that kind of became like an SDK for developers that we would sell to all kinds of companies like Tencent, HTC, Vodafone, Verizon, um H&M and so forth and it was like licensing licensing the SDK but also like kind of custom building the avatar system around that so bodies animations like all the stuff that people needed in different styles for different engines and that was the business for like four years um and then um after doing that for combined six years <laughs> hardware and and custom building stuff we kind of figured out the way to build um, a very easy to use avatar system for developers that people can integrate on their own. And that's, uh, and kind of build a platform platform around that. So that's where we basically pivoted to Ready Player Me. Um, and Ready Player Me is like, you know, launched, launched less than three years ago. Um, we're now used by 6,000 companies that um, integrate Ready Player Me with their games, virtual worlds, experiences. And as an end user, you can use the same exact avatar in all the different experiences and worlds that we work with. And um, the reason we think this is important to build is, you know, the metaverse kind of has two paths. Uh, one is a centralized path where it will be owned by one company or a few companies. And the other is a more open and decentralized path, um, uh, which means that, you know, the metaverse will be more like the internet where you can navigate between different worlds or different pages. Uh, and have a some, kind of a somewhat consistent experience. Um, and we think an open metaverse is a better outcome for the world because we're going to spend a lot of time in virtual worlds. And it's not good for one company to own that, so own the virtual world. Um, so yeah, and for the open metaverse to have a chance, they need to be standards and protocols and services that kind of link different virtual worlds together and make it easy for people to navigate between worlds. And avatars are a hugely important part of that. So um, 
that's kind of like uh, some background. And I'm, you know, 29. I've been doing doing building outers for outers for nine years. So that's pretty much everything I've done in my life. <laughs> wow, that's quite a story. So, how do you, you know, you went through all of these things. Sometimes from the eye, when you do something like that. Uh, it's hard to see what connects a dot for you internally, but probably everyone who works on something for such a long time follows like a higher level vision, you know, something, mm -hmm. a dream that you want to realize. Mm -hmm. So probably the question would be, what, what is the dream, you know, drives you all the way from back when you were gaming through mm -hmm. all these hardware endeavors up to starting Ready Player Me? Like what, what drives you? What, what makes you yeah. tick, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's definitely an element of just being stubborn <laughs> and not wanting to fail and just keeping keep, keeping it going, um, which is kind of just an entrepreneurial kind of spirit. But um, uh, other, than, other than that, you know, like obviously we started um, because the core kind of core path was that people spend more and more time in virtual worlds every year uh, that goes by in games, in VR, AR, like, you know, in all kinds of different ways. And um, throughout these nine years, like it was very clear that this is like very true. Like people started, you know, like Roblox and Fortnite and, and things like that show that there's a whole generation of people that don't call themselves gamers, but they hang out with their friends in games and they come, games become like social platforms. You know, throughout that time, it was like Memoji and all kinds of things like that started coming around. So I just became more like a normal mainstream thing. So it was always obvious for us that, okay, like this is like really, like the world is moving in the right direction, which gave us a lot of like um, hope and energy to keep keep going. And then um, uh, also like we basically built a new product every year and every product we built was more successful um, in in many, uh, many ways. So, so yeah, it was kind of like um, on one end we were making progress, we were learning a lot. Also as founders, we were learning a lot about, um, <laughs> how life works uh and then uh, you know the, the world was kind of moving in the right direction uh which i don't know we didn't really have many moments where we were like actually thinking about like quitting or anything like that and the um and the kind of like the custom outer system building business was a cash flow positive business and, and growing so you know that was also um good yeah but uh i think it's just like the most exciting thing to work on uh and now it's like it's obviously such an important part of that new world uh, avatars identities interoperability in general like it's like you know i just can't imagine anything that is more cool <laughs> that I would, I would like to do uh, so that that just also has been driving us as well so probably like a lot like you could you could choose the path you know to attach yourself to like one of the major platforms and say hey you know mm. i'm i know this stuff i can help you to mm -hmm. make really cool avatars mm. but what pro i mean you must be a, a, a quite a big uh, negotiation talent you know to get to all of these places <laughs> and say hey you know actually what i gotta be the platform for your platform <laughs> get these <laughs> avatars in there so yeah. how how important is this inter interoperability for you you know and and, and mm -hmm. what how important was it for you to push that and, and bring that into this market, into this uh, metaverse? Yeah, it was very important because it felt like this is like how the world was, was is supposed to work, you know. Um, and it's always like even from the hardware days, it was like, um, um, you know, the, the goal was always to have a database of avatars and then like make those with games and make those avatars go to different games. And it's been like, it's like a, it's like, that's how things are supposed to, like, that's how they should work. So uh, it's always been like a, an obvious thing for us that just needs to happen. And uh, with the metaverse or virtual worlds kind of like evolving around us, it's just like, it's just more and more obvious how important that is. Um, and on the negotiation part, I, I would say like, this is actually, uh, you know, we're like 99% um, inbound driven, uh, the kind of developer adoption. So, it's uh, it's mostly because like we have great tools that solve a very clear problem for developers. Instead of developers having to spend many months on building their own outer system, they use Ready Plan Me. 
So even without the authors being interoperable, Ready Pemi is a very useful tool for developers. And that's what kind of drives the early market. And then over time, as more and more people use the tools, we kind of become you know, the standard. And then we can you know, help developers with acquiring users from the existing community. We can help them sell virtual assets that work in thousands of games, not only in their game. So like uh, come for the tools, stay for the network. And I would say like most of the, like 99% of the success is behind just the product you know, just building the right product. And and also like the business model, you know, the business model is like, we take a revenue share from from uh, selling skins and assets um, uh, and like the tools are free for anyone to use. They're like, you're not behind a paywall. They're just, you know, you can, they're open. You can just go and, and start building right away. So there's like a few kind of key decisions there and also how the, the product is built and, and how easy it is to kind of set it up compared to what people would imagine an outer system. It's a very complex thing usually. Um, and, uh, and I think those things are really like 99% of the success. Um, and then everything gets kind of easy. You know, if you have product market fit, you're basically taking orders. <laughs> like you're not like going out there and selling. Like, yeah, I guess like this is true for like a, a market where you have a very strong product market fit. Like for us right now, it's like how do we get to the more traditional bigger studios that build, you know have massive budgets, like all those things. That that's not easy. <laughs> uh, that's not taking yeah. orders. Yeah, like what what are like examples where I probably a lot of the listeners don't don't know Ready Player Me so much. Maybe well, mm -hmm. what are like the the environments that you would find your your work mm -hmm. yeah so some some games and worlds you would you would you could use um with ready pay outdoors vr chat uh was a kind of a first bigger one for example it's like a the biggest vr experience um spatial which is kind of a web-based game social world platform just launched wink which is a kind of chat roulette with avatars like a mobile social experience um there's like a top five social app in many markets. Um, yeah, so experiences like that, you know, hyper user-generated games and worlds. Um, it, it's mostly like um, kind of up and coming startups. Yeah, Wink, that's it. Wink app. It's like, a, it's kind of, it has a dating element to it as well. But like what we're excited about is like the chat roulette with avatars where again, like if, if you remember chat roulette, you know, it's like um, you put, someone together with a random video, but nothing good happens in those videos normally. If you have an avatar, then you can control the environment so people can't like, um, you know, ruin the experience. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting to see, for example, that's like a very recent thing. But yeah, most of it's, it's a lot of games, it's a lot of like VR experiences. It's also some education uh, apps. There's some like virtual training, enterprise training, um, you know, there's a like nuclear, nuclear, plant um kind of training like uh, nuclear plant training <laughs> it's like they're training people to operate nuclear plants uh in vr uh with our avatars for example so there's a lot all, all kinds of different experiences do i have a connection uh, problem no so so you're good i think valentin's okay. frozen i guess well, well, I'm a, hi, my name is Kathy. I'm one of the TAs of the course. Uh, while mm -hmm. Valentin is trying to get back online, uh, um, to follow up on something he asked and you said earlier, um, you know, there's many different platforms that started to adopt your product. Um, and I've actually been following your um, journey mm -hmm. since the Wolf 3D days. Uh, <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm really curious about the design decision you made behind the style mm -hmm. of the avatar because you know like mm -hmm. different platforms have their own designs initially but there i mean there perhaps is a reason why people you know chose to use ready player me versus other ones um mm -hmm. and i'm curious if you could break us down uh, break, break down a little bit of the um choice mm -hmm. behind this particular style ranging from mm -hmm. you know there's the hyper realism and uh the meta perhaps is pursuing and versus the mm -hmm. you know Roblox or um, mm -hmm. um, very simple, like to toy looking uh, yeah. avatars. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so when we kind of chose our style and you know, before that we had built avatars in like dozens of styles from like very realistic to like super cartoony. Um, we chose the style because it was kind of in between uh, realistic and cartoony. So, you know, if you create an avatar from a selfie, 
you can still kind of like have some face shapes that um, are kind of close to yours. Uh, you can still kind of be recognizable. Um, and it kind of like it's it's a it kind of covers a lot of different uh, aesthetics. Um, so it's kind of like general and easy to consume while being like realistic enough. Um, but this style is not like we, we will create more styles. Uh, that's not something we're working on now. Uh, there might be an anime style coming um, soon or at some point. Uh, and then like AI is like um, a potential way to really like stylize things on scale. Um, so we're doing a lot of research there. Um, overall, I think, you know, the current ready payment style covers the world that are pretty kind of social focused, are more targeted to like a general social media user, more casual kind of a player over like a, like a, you know, like a very gamer game. Uh, like a gamer game would be more kind of specific to an age or style or feel. Uh, uh, and it would be more kind of like connected to a story and, and so forth. But like ready for me right now covers like kind of social virtual worlds, metaverses, uh, things like that uh, pretty well. I'm back. Hey. <laughs> Net network broke down. No worries. I, I think I, I'll ask two more questions and because the team has a lot of interesting questions as well. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just opening a little bit. I think uh, two questions that I, that I would like, love to throw at you is like, what are like your... I now understand, you know, you, you came through all of these different stages and you always mm -hmm. went a step forward. Like, what are these the big roadblocks that are just right now ahead of you where you're mm -hmm. hitting your head against and you wish that would that would go away? That's uh -huh. one question. The other question is um wh wh what uh what what is like the, the technology that you would love to see developing mm -hmm. forward? to to like liber liberate your avatars like uh -huh. is it hardware is it software is it platform is it like low layer stuff like what you would love yeah. to see totally yeah um so the first one was basically current roadblocks roadblocks um so i would say like the biggest roadblock roadblock is the fact that the kind of traditional gaming industry, which is the best, you know, they're, they're the best people to know how to build interesting virtual experiences. Um, you know, the gaming industry is massive and has all the skills for doing that. Um, this world is not used to thinking about open economies like uh, interoperability. You know, building a game is is, uh, is it's actually not an easy business to be in. You know, it's a very hit driven industry. Oftentimes you spend years building a game and then it just flops. Um, so it kind of makes the industry quite risk averse. Uh, people don't really want to experiment with new types of ways to monetize games or new types of kind of like um, economies that are more open and so forth. Because like if you get a hit, you want to make sure that you can monetize it. And the way people know you can monetize is like closed economy, you can control it fully, you have your own assets, like all that stuff. So basically like, the, the challenge in the roadblock is basically to show that industry with enough data that if they would open up, they would actually benefit. Like there would be a better user experience and they would also make more money, which is important for the traditional games to open up. They don't want to open up because it's like philosophically right or whatever. They're like, uh, you know, they, they're like in the open metaverse camp. Uh, that's like not enough for them basically. So um, the moment we want to get to right now is like, you know, to show two games that if you, have, if you have a sneaker that works in one game versus in a thousand games, and uh, then selling the sneaker that works in a thousand games makes you more money. So it becomes like a no brainer business, business decision to join the network and, you know, build a more open economy, open up the avatar system, and then hopefully other parts of the game uh, more over time. So I would say that is the main roadblock. It's, it's the mindset of the, of the industry. And, and like, this is the thing you can't really solve with, you know, um, more people, hiring more people or building, you know, a better product. Uh, you can nudge it that way, but it just takes time and you need to gather data. I would say like there's there's enough early kind of like adopters that are philosophically open metaverse minded. that are open to try out these things like the Web3 uh, game space definitely has uh, nudged the gaming world towards that in that direction a little bit. 
Um, so our goal basically is to use this like first small part of the metaverse, make it more open and prove to the rest of the world that this is a better way to build games. And once we do that, then that's that's when things get, um, then that's where we can start onboarding the people that are not philosophically aligned with the, with the idea. It's more like a practical business decision. So uh, that's the biggest thing <laughs> at the moment. So it's interesting. You have like a, a gaming industry that itself grew out of experimenting and and you know building stuff, and it has settled. And now you have that that's a wall that you feel not running in. Yeah. And, and earlier we learned about you know how how dangerous that is because we expose us uh, to to these um, to these platforms. Athena mentioned that and. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 you become part of them, but um, but but you're you're not owned by them. Like the, the, mm -hmm. you you want to travel from these different places. What came to my yeah. mind was you know little Lego minifigures or something that uh -huh. you play uh -huh. as a child with you. You know <laughs> you find them somewhere when you clean up, and you're like, oh wow, there's a memory with that. You know these yeah. things from my past. And, yeah. Um, and uh, I think that there's something I've learned today about about the, the identity and and, and mm -hmm. that they need to be a, a shift. And it probably has to do a shift from like offline gaming, network mm -hmm. gaming. But now there's a different quality to gaming, right? When when you're like in these virtual worlds and you want to have them mm -hmm. all connected and be yeah. in those with, with your identity. Yes. Yeah, and the more social the world's get, and the more, yeah, the, the more like impactful it is. Um, kind of just the representation itself, and and the fact that it can travel with you across across platforms. Yeah. And then I, I had the second part of the question, which was the technology. Um, I would say like um, it's uh, right now, uh, it's kind of the stylization, stylization, stylizing the avatars um to kind of the target aesthetics i think that's like a, a, an impactful pro impactful problem to solve um and then in, ge in general like 3d asset creation i think is also interesting and generative ai you know we believe that the 3d generation will be pretty good in them you know even maybe this year or at least next year so i think those things will also accelerate and open up like um, new people that can now create assets for avatars and for other, you know, for virtual worlds generally um, that, that don't have the 3D skills or, and so forth. So, um, which is going to be very interesting. The kind of cards are going to be shuffled in the industry a little bit. Yeah. And it also makes like, you know, game production much cheaper uh, if you don't have to create all the assets by hand. That's true. Mm hmm I'm um I'm 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 asking more questions into the team, Kathy mm -hmm. and um, Daniel and Joe. You want to follow up also with some questions? Sure. Um, I read somewhere you may have worked with uh, people from Stanford, like Jeremy Balenson, and you know he was mm -hmm. also mentioned by Athena, who just gave the talk. Um, I'm curious if internally your team has done some research on the effect of um, the stylized avatar on people's interactions. Um, and, and even, you know, we, we talked about the people now have a choice to embody in, in a specific, even skin color and not beyond mm -hmm. just like style, um, styles of the clothes or the hair. Mm -hmm. um, curious if you have any thoughts about that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so what the lab tested with our avatars or uh, we researched is uh, basically they, they took avatars and they made them older. And then they, they, they basically, they kind of like, um, kind of like measured the effects um, of, of that to like your behavior, uh, and like your, your financial behavior, for example. So, uh, so like, you know, would you like make better financial decisions if you kind of empathize with the older version of yourself? And there was some kind of a, impact to that but it was quite of a long time ago so i can't remember exactly what else they did um it was like when we were wolf 3d um they used our avatars i think maybe we really pay me as well but there were there were things like that basically that was um kind of like the goal was to understand if 
embodying different types of outdoors will change uh, your behavior. Uh, and it did. <laughs> that was one of the tests I remember. But um, yeah, like I think another one was like using an outdoor uh, of some of like a different ethnicity and seeing how that kind of uh, basically uh, changes your empathy towards towards a different group of people and, and things like that. And they did they, they did have an impact. Um, but yeah, I, it was a long time ago, so I don't kind of remember the details. I like you, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, it, when you uh, allow people to make certain choices, do you have any constraints on what things people cannot do with the um, avatars platforms that you mm -hmm. have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we allow people to be very like flexible with how they want to create themselves. And I don't think we're like, we're flexible enough, actually. Uh, like we're building things, launching soon, like, you know, body shapes and age and like things like that, that you can like uh, customize further or more. But overall, like what we, really, we believe is that everyone be supposed to be able to create their own identity, either from scratch uh, or from an image. And it's up to, up to them how they kind of represent themselves. We haven't yet seen, you know, situations where someone has created like an offensive outer. Um, at least it hasn't come to like us. Um, so that wasn't hasn't been like a problem where we thought about that. Uh, they were thought we have thought of. Uh, it will be a problem with user generated content for sure. So uh, you know we definitely review all the assets that are cross game, so that go to different worlds. All those assets are reviewed by us. If it's a, if it's an asset that is built for a game, then just like you know we don't want to be the the kind of like the. Um, uh, we don't want to like guard that like you should be able to do whatever you want in your game basically and hopefully on, on the offensive things like that's um with terms of service and stuff we can limit that but we don't review each asset and each avatar in that sense um because yeah we're tools we just want to get out of the way but if it's a cross game then we take a responsibility and we review review things um yeah but overall um I think even like creating outer assets, like clothing assets and accessories and things like that. Like we're one company. There's no way we can create assets that are like suitable for the whole world. That's why we think UGC is an, an important part of um, of building great outers, great identities. Like uh, if there's creators, they they know like each of them, you know, knows their own um, whatever uh, group and, and and builds for them. And that's the only way we can cover and have enough like. Uh, uh, like outdoors and as accessories that are diverse enough for like everyone in the world. Yeah, anyone, Joe, or anybody on the online uh, online audience? Mm -hmm. I can keep asking questions, but I don't want to dominate the. <laughs> go go for it. <laughs> keep yeah. asking. And and I'm I'm just I'm playing devil's advocate here. Like if someone mm -hmm. um, you know decides to behave and even try to look exactly how I look in a world, you mm -hmm. know, I presume that's possible. Um, mm -hmm. How how do you safeguard that? And people really do find affinity to the avatars, uh, as we've heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mean like if someone wants to embody someone else? Yeah, I mean, especially with such a stylized uh, avatar, and I could mm -hmm. tweak it such that okay, I could claim that this is me, and even maybe with some voice uh, adaptation, I can even sound like someone else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. From, yeah, from so fake, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you can do that by just creating an avatar from scratch. You can create a celebrity avatar and use it in a game. If it's you know, you can upload that. If it's a game, it has like an open avatar policy or whatever um there's no good way to manage that besides like reporting and uh having kind of users self self-report things and and so forth like uh it, it, it's not a big big enough a problem yet because the authors are pretty cartoony so even if you create like a celebrity author or whatever or someone specific it's still like it's still so cartoony that you can't really you know you don't achieve that effect um but with more realistic authors, it will be a bigger problem. And then it's a question like, do you want to have some kind of a blockchain system where you have to validate your avatar? Do you even maybe do a KYC 
you know, and then you can use that in different platforms. Like that's possible, especially for like a work environment. Uh, probably that's like needed. Um, but uh, but yeah, like basically how we think about building things is like what do develop developers need, and then build for that. Um, Right now, developers mostly handle all those problems like on their end with uh, reporting and, and whatever kind of moderation tools they have them, themselves. And we just kind of focus on the avatars. But long term, maybe there are things that we will, we will, um, we will add. So like you do KYC once on your outer identity, and then you can use that across platforms. And we kind of like make sure that this is, um, this is a validated avatar, real identity, whatever. But uh, yeah, those are not things that I think are very um, kind of like problems of today, uh, but there will be problems in the future. Great. Um, we have a question in the audience. Uh, Paige Mollis is going to uh, chime in. Uh, do you want to go on video, Paige, or audio? I guess I, I can read it or- Okay, read. sorry, here we go. I couldn't um, tell if I needed to unmute myself or not, but yeah, so I work in a, an environment that is um, not necessarily tech related and just kind of thinking of, way, of ways to kind of bring people along to this environment and being mm -hmm. able to um, kind of, Kathy, to your point of thinking about how you can create an avatar that looks like you would be a familiar way to kind of like help lead the horse to water, so to speak. And mm -hmm. so open to any other suggestions or ideas that you might have around that to get more adopters um, that are not particularly in the tech world. Yeah. So I would say like what makes people adopt uh, virtual worlds is some start using some kind of like outer based applications it's more about the kind of application itself. Um, the avatar is just uh, a tool or like a part of an experience. It doesn't make a game fun. Uh, it kind of like can enhance enhance a game that is fun. Um, you know, it doesn't make a virtual meeting like good uh, unless the virtual meeting software is not good. So anyways, like I would say that there needs to be a, a thing you want to do um, and the application in a virtual world needs to do it better than the application you would use in a non-virtual world. So if you have a Zoom meeting, then the VR meeting you would use instead of that should be actually better than the Zoom meeting. Like, um, and I don't think that's like really the case yet. So, um, uh, you know, most of the applications that people enjoy in virtual worlds are still games. And even if they don't call themselves as gamers, like, you know, you might go to Fortnite and you, yes, you shoot people there and stuff and like, you're like, running around on a space, but you actually like hanging out with your friends. It's kind of similar to like hanging out on a basketball court. You go to a basketball court with your friends, you throw a few hoops, but actually you just hang out and do things together. And socially, socializing with your friends is the main thing. Um, and the same with like games and social experiences. And um, I don't think, yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's like, it should be a goal on its own to, um, push more people to the virtual world, kind of like not naturally. I think the applications and the things that we build need to become more useful for more people and that will naturally bring more people to the space. Uh, but that is an interesting thing to try, uh, even if you're not a gamer, just to create an outer. And, but it's, um, yeah, I think it's all about the thing you can do and the value you get. Mm -hmm. Either the entertainment value or, or just the actual whatever, yeah. Or... The curiosity, you got to be able to bring in the curious people and kind of get them on mm -hmm. board. I also think somehow layering it onto something that is familiar. Um, and so that's why I was curious about um, the other presenter was had mentioned something about mm -hmm. layering onto teams now that it's just kind of like second nature to folks. So maybe that will eventually be available for those on Mac, but um, and what, yep. do you guys offer anything like that? Do you have any kind of add-on that works with some of these systems? Uh, for like video calls? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can bring mine up. <clears throat> um, ah, there we go. There <laughs> I love it. So this is like um, 
I would say like the express expressiveness is still not quite there. You know, you can use it as like, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a solution, but it's not like uh, as good as like using a video. Uh, and this is our partner of ours, uh, joinhallway.com is where you can get this from. Okay. And we have a few of those like that are coming up as well. Joinhallway.com. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's fun. See, that's fun. I think that would bring people in. Yeah. You don't know who your boss is, then you have to go figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> we have a question from Joe, I think. Hi, Timo. Um, mm-hmm. Great to see you come. Thank you very much for, for spending time with us and, and, and you know the, the great points you're, you're sharing. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, that's also weird because your faces will be here, of course. Yeah. Has all these constraints. But that gets to okay. kind of my, my question because it reminds me of the old fire. You probably don't know the Fireside Theater, but uh, you know, mm-hmm. they were a very famous comedy group when I was a kid, and we derived our means from them. And one of the best ones is how can you be in two places at once when you're not anywhere at all? And that kind of bears credence when we talk about metaverse and virtual spaces. Uh, yeah. And I'm wondering, can you be more than one avatar or will you be efficient? Because I would love to be in two places at once. And mm-hmm. you could you know, have an AI kind of drive my avatar when I'm not there. And then I could inhabit it uh, you know, when I want to be there and somehow or other sync to the ones that aren't there. It's on my mind because we had a long uh, panel yesterday about trying to connect people in space across delay. You know, astronauts on long duration missions, if you ever do them, they're going to be at extreme delay. And, and yeah, they may want to have real time conversations with your know, family, loved ones or other people. They can't do it realistically. Uh, one solution may be to talk to uh, is it could be chat with with a you know, trained representation. It could even be an avatar or Uncanny Valley and other things. But years from now, that may be better. Uh, mm-hmm. But what do you think about this kind of a thing where you can basically have a, avatars be autonomous, but be somewhat realistic and then inhabit them. You've got the peripheral, which kind of does that in the real world, right? The, mm-hmm. the show on, mm-hmm. uh, on, what is it, uh, Amazon. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they, they just go slack when you're not there. When you're there, they have a personality. But that doesn't have to be true. Is at this point now they can, you know, be a reflection of you to some extent. Then you can maybe sync up after. So any, any thoughts about this? Just forking yourself. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... That, that makes sense. I mean, like looking at all the stuff happening in AI now, it's like definitely going to be possible, at least some like for like some light kind of interaction. I guess the question is like, does this AI need to have a visual representation? Like, does it, you know, like, do you need to have an avatar? Like, uh, you know, if it's AI interacting with AI, then like doesn't, doesn't, doesn't need to be, that doesn't need to have an avatar in that sense. If you have your own avatar, you know, maybe in, uh, on your lot in a virtual world that, you know, tries to represent you as you're not there, while they're not there, maybe it does need to have an avatar with interaction with other people. But um, yeah, we're like not that focused on the intelligence parts, uh, part of avatars, uh, more about the visual representation and transferring that and, and so forth. And maybe we get to a point when if that happens, there'll be a regulation in these different worlds where if you're not physically inhabiting the avatar, there's some representational uh, manifestation where you can see it's not really you, but you know, it's yeah. kind of, so it's intriguing. Well, we have, we, yeah, one of our investors has the like this like dream that someone will build a game, Jack from Andreessen Horvitz, uh, he has a dream that someone will build a game for bots. So you basically train your own AI to like play the game. And the game is about like having the better AI, better AI or a better bot, essentially, uh, which I think is a pretty interesting idea. So, uh, uh, yeah, that would be cool to see if that happens. A lot of places it can go. Thanks. Yeah. That's an interesting, interesting perspective. You know, in a, a lot of industries, there is um, the, the level of skill went one up instead of actually building something. Mm-hmm. You're now maintaining a machine that builds for you. And that is yeah. kind of the concept probably, right? That's right. You're, yeah. you're, you're on the meta level in the background mm-hmm. pulling the string. Mm-hmm. That's right. Timu, I have a I, question. I, I, oh, sorry, Valentin. Um, I'm curious how, uh, and maybe I'm not sure if Ready Player Me interacts with the space at all, but what's your perspective on digital assets and the commerce of virtual uh, consumables? Mm-hmm. Wearables? Yeah. Clothing in the virtual space, Couture, 
and art even, um, how these things might relate to the metaverse and digital life. Do you have any, um, does, does my first question is, does Ready Player Me have any investment in that space for mm -hmm. accelerating it or, and what's your otherwise your yeah. philosophy? For sure. Yeah, so uh, first, you know, it's already a massive market, like games make money with by selling virtual assets and goods and so forth. So that's like a V way games already make money. And the other thing is that you kind of like the amount of money you spend uh, on virtual goods is correlated with the amount of time you spend in virtual worlds, of course. And the amount of time people spend in virtual worlds like is increasing every year. So like the, the amount of money people spend in virtual worlds is also increasing uh, with that, of course. So the virtual kind of economy is going to be bigger and more important over time. And what we believe is that if you make that economy open, so people can sell and, and create assets that travel across thousands of virtual worlds, uh, then you know that makes the kind of the market bigger, the pie is bigger for everyone to share. And that's kind of our goal with avatar assets and interoperable assets generally. Um, so, and, and very practical examples of that is, you know, you mentioned like virtual fashion, for example, it's like, um, you know, in a closed metaverse, uh, in order for you to sell virtual assets as a game, or sorry, as a brand, you have to go to individual games and make a deal with them and create assets in their style and in their technical specifications and, and all these things. It's just not doable. You can do it with a few big games, but that's it. Um, in a more open world, you can go to, um, you know, you can sell assets that work in thousands of experiences. Like we help brands do that. We work with uh, Dior, Adidas, New Balance, Colin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, uh, Warner Brothers, like for like IP, um, IP kind of driven assets uh, and so forth. So, so anyways, like, and what they can do now is like they can come to Ready Me, integrate with our avatars, and then their virtual goods, virtual fashion is usable across all the games we work with. So they can focus on creating assets, selling it to their end users. You know, one of the, one of the bigger big brands is building a, a a website right now for virtual fashion that will be plugged into Ready Pair Me, so people can just create assets and sell them across across worlds, uh, which makes this a, a bigger opportunity for brands um, and also for individual creators and so forth. But overall, like this is how we generate revenue as a company. Like we take a revenue share from virtual goods sales. Um, which allows us to keep the tools free and monetize with the games that you know, with the games that, that become successful, and also with the brands that want to get into into virtual worlds. So, overall, yes, that's def definitely a big believer in that market being continuing to grow fast and 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 being very big in the future. And our goal is to basically push it towards a more open kind of a marketplace that exists across games not just, uh, you know, closed marketplaces inside games. So in that I have way, a, yeah. I have a, a, go, a follow up yeah, question, yeah. but you go. <laughs> well, I guess my, my follow up uh, thought was just, I, if you can clarify, so within Ready Player Me, uh, customer users can acquire assets or is it externally and then they come into Ready Player Me? That I don't understand the difference. Both, yeah, oh, both, oh, both. Okay. Yeah, so you can buy, well, today we don't actually sell things. We have sold some NFTs directly on Reddit Pay Me, but it's not a thing we do actively. But now it's allowing developers games to sell stuff in the game and all the stuff they sell is usable across all the other games. And then it's external kind of like brands selling stuff on their website and then making this, these things accessible, uh, you know, usable on Reddit Pay Me. Um, and then eventually we'll build our own market marketplace with kind of which kind of aggregates all the different assets from games from external places and then you can buy it from there as well but uh, that's not the first goal for us first thing is to allow games and brands to sell stuff Very cool. so i have a i have a follow-up question to this whole space mm -hmm. of all these uh game items and so on um i find this fascinating i just read something today like there's a, 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 a like a, a a skin for for Counter Strike or something. It went for like hundred twenty thousand dollars or something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy market, you know. Mm -hmm. And and that brings me to it's kind of like a, a, a cyberpunk ish question, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, imagine you can you can take all these objects with you and you are your identity and you you travel through those different games, you know. In each game, you can do different things. So mm -hmm. you can 
start playing the games throughout multiple games. So you can go yeah. to the one game, take an item from there, that you know, that powers you up in the other game or that yes. almost allows you to hack the other game in a certain way that uh -huh. it was never intended to do. So uh -huh. I find this a pretty fascinating perspective. Yeah. But then also when you think about, you know, you, you're, you come from the gaming perspective. So there's a lot of like shooting at things and then there's the uh -huh. other perspective of like people meeting up spaces and so like you have the intercompatibility is not just on a technical perspective it's also on the what community is this you know is this the running mm -hmm. around and shooting stuff community mm -hmm. or is this the hanging out and dancing <laughs> community or you know yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and then you get back into the cyberpunk perspective like hey I, I go into this space but then go into that space to bring things with me into the third space and then totally mm -hmm. disrupt it or that's a fascinating yeah. That's yeah. the that's the exciting and also the dangerous or like the the, the you know uh, the part that game developers are afraid of a little bit right it's like uh, okay what if I allow other assets other assets to come into my game like what does that do like I mean you don't have to allow like guns and things like that because then that they have different utility in different games and so forth but even just the aesthetics like um, how does that affect my game like does it make it more fun or less fun uh does it make people like stay more in my game or like leave faster or whatever so like those are those are the, those are the things that people don't have any data uh for or about or whatever so um that's what makes game companies reluctant to change before they see those things happening that's what makes it kind of like um yeah it takes time to to kind of like nudge the industry or the right or like turn the industry in the right direction it's incredible actually you think about going from grand theft auto to animal crossing right and it's like you got to check <laughs> your guns at the gate before getting on the plane and you come off you can get them again uh the metaphor yeah. is just fascinating yeah i i want to see the the youtube channel where people you know it's like the minecrafting of identity and yeah yeah all of these like special tricks <laughs> Yeah. Do you, do, uh, do you see a yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go for it now. Good. Do you see a world where, you know, there's the intercompatibility between the different games, but do you also see a world where there's an intercompatibility between you know, export import into ready player me? So for example, you have those mm -hmm. mods in, you know, something like Counter Strike where mm -hmm. where the items, you know, you might want to import into Ready Player Me, mm -hmm. bring it into your space, or somebody mm -hmm. crafts an identity that they mm -hmm. want to bring outside of Ready Player Me into some mm -hmm. environment. What what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, totally. So we, we did something uh something like that uh, recently. We uh, uh partnered up with Mini Royale far away. It's uh, one of the biggest kind of web three shooters. And then um, uh, basically they had like hundreds of thousands of avatars people had, had created before uh, as NFTs as well. And then uh, all of the avatars from the game are now usable on Ready Me. So like if you have that NFT, that avatar, you can connect it to connect your wallet and use that avatar in all the different games we work with. That's kind of like the first time an avatar from a game is actually travel, you know, actually travels to many other games, which is like exciting. And that's how, how we see ourselves long term. It's like more like rails for avatars or infrastructure for avatars than an avatar company that, you know, we're the only avatar and the only assets and stuff. It's more about like making other avatars travel. So if uh, CSGO assets or avatars want to come out of CSGO and go to other games, then yes, we want to make that happen. Um, you know, Fortnite avatars coming out of Fortnite. Um, that's that's um yeah and then there, there are like there are types of worlds um that only want to export and not import um uh, like very ip kind of like driven stories worlds games like you know you can see see star wars characters on fortnite but you can't see fortnite characters on star wars like games um so so like that's kind of like the the way we think about it um and and yeah so and Let's see. <laughs> Let's see how things play that, out. That's interesting. That that opens a, a whole different question. Mm -hmm. It started when you talked about this. It started to come up there, but now the last point really drove it home. Was you can't bring mm -hmm. Fortnite into Star Wars. 
the storytelling aspect of the game developer community. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to curate so strongly mm -hmm. how you experience your game and then in the multi-session environment, how others experience you as a character in their story. But yeah. now you have like anarchy, you know, like you have every, everyone comes with how they want to show up, you know, and then mm -hmm. you have this like nicely curated Star Wars story and suddenly mm -hmm. you have, mm -hmm. I don't know, the, the little uh, minifigure coming in like extra large uh, uh, marshmallow men. You know? yeah. I don't know. You know, and when, people uh, start playing with their own story and bringing the, them into that. And I know from YouTube, there's a lot of like fan communities that would build like Star Wars movies or Star mm -hmm. Trek movies. And then the, the companies would go after them because they don't want their storylines to be disturbed. So this is very yeah. fascinating to, to, to mm -hmm. learn and see that. I agree. I agree. And um, yeah, and there are some games that are like playgrounds that want all this like craziness to happen. And there's some other games that are more like stories that want to control every piece. Yeah. I feel like this would also be very exciting for students, you know, who want to embody in, uh, you know, historical figures or just transform themselves to really understand the context of, of things. Um, kind of on top on on that topic, how maybe mm -hmm. do you ever think about uh, for education or maybe how students, even for this class, could potentially use your technology and mm -hmm. you know play around with it? Yeah, I mean you can create your own avatar at readyplayer.me, and then there's a selection of games and experiences that you can choose from depending on what you're interested in. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, that that's 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 the way best way to kind of get started. Ready player that me. Um, yeah, and like the marketplace experience is not something we've been putting a lot of energy into, like finding a best game, the best game for you right now. It's more about the developer experience, but um, it gives you some kind of an idea of where things are going at least. I guess if if someone is not a developer, like you know, they don't have any familiarity with, uh, I presume Unity um, and mm -hmm. and real other major platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, how could people start using or you know develop further, just beyond just create an avatar, like use it in actual? Yeah, I guess spatial IO is yeah. Yep, spatial is an, is one you can try out, uh, which is like web based, easy to access, and ready for me has like, you know, when you create your avatar, after that, we actually show a bunch of different games you can use, um, including spatial, but whatever you, you like, uh, there's a lot of them there. And we do have in two weeks, we have uh, Gina Lee from, from Spatial also uh -huh. giving a talk. Cool. So we will, <laughs> we'll close yeah, the loop it's cool. there. It's cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Daniel, we have, we have uh, time for maybe one, one last question from the room. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that, that was unanswered? Otherwise I have, I have one closing question myself. <laughs> yeah. Is, um, what is like, is there, you know, you, you see those other, like you see Ready Player Me deployed in, in the wild, you see how people mm -hmm. use it and what they build. Is there anything that was unexpected for you? Anything where, mm. where like your technology went, where you're like, oh, how is, how, how is that possible? <laughs> or how do, why do they do that? Or like, what's happening here? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's like, um, yeah, like one interesting one was like House of Math. They kind of teach kids math online with avatars, uh, which was like kind of interesting, uh, that that kind of like works and they're going fast. Um, I don't know, like there's there's a lot of like crazy things or things that like I'm not sure if it makes sense. <laughs> Sometimes, um, yeah. I don't know if I have um, a great example besides that one right now. I guess like the nuclear plant like uh, training was pretty cool that was like wow this is like that makes sense like um it's an easier way to actually train people um and it was not obvious for me at least that's you know a few some some time ago yeah i don't have a great answer 
Okay. There's one last question from Sherry. Uh, do, do you want to unmute yourself or should we ask it for you? Uh, no, that's fine. <laughs> I yeah, just, okay. uh, you know, in listening to you and in listening to Athena and, mm -hmm. uh, and to some of the other amazing people that have spoken during these uh, classes, uh, mm -hmm. it seems that there are so many things coming and so many opportunities around like, you know, personal therapy or around, uh, you know, just business, like, you know, mm -hmm. having an office, having a whatever. And I hear mm -hmm. you talking about bridging, um, you know, different applications uh, and, uh, you know, kind of porting your avatar uh, to all sorts of different applications. Do you have mm -hmm. any plans to port to things that are maybe not about gaming, that are about mm -hmm. other things? Because I, mm -hmm. I could see how you could really attach to these identities and then mm -hmm. to, but, you know, you, you might want to use them in other contexts. So mm -hmm. just, just wondering. Yeah. So, um, yeah, about like 30, 40 percent of our applications are actually gaming. The rest is like not non gaming stuff. There's, there's like business, there's like uh, VR meeting, virtual events, VR meetings, virtual events, um, all kinds of things like that. Like our first partner actually was Mozilla Hubs, which is like a web based kind of a 3D events uh, meeting space. Um, yeah, like education I mentioned as well, um, training. Uh, so there's a lot of applications that are not not gaming necessarily. But gaming is just a market where like this is where this is why people spend most of the time most time in virtual worlds today. So that's why it's an important market, and that's why kind of the metaverse comes from from games and also the talent in the game games industry knows how to build interesting virtual experiences. Thank you. Wonderful. Timo, we spent an entire hour with you. Thank you so yeah. much for answering our questions and telling us about your work. And uh, it was uh, fascinating course. to listen and learn. So, Amazing. Thanks for having me. And, and that's, uh, that was a great chat. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.